The logo drop is like so legit. It like scares me sometimes. What's up? I'm Jimmy. This is PT Pinecast, a podcast that saves physical therapists from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories in the world of physical therapy. I'm Jimmy McKay. I'm your host. We're broadcasting live from the Arius Medical Studios. Find them online at aureusmedical.com. Leaders in hashtag travel PT, letting you do what you want to do, which is be a great physical therapist, whatever that means to you, physical therapist, assistant, whatever, uh, anywhere you want to do it. It's, I mean, they literally give you a license to be a physical therapist. Let it take you where you want to go. So find out what they have available where you can do great stuff at aureusmedical.com. They're the easiest sponsor to talk about. It's just an easy segue. It's like they just want physical therapists to do good stuff where they want to do it. The end. Repeat. aureusmedical.com. Show. Uh, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss anything. God forbid. iTunes, Spotify, uh, Deezer, uh, Stitcher Radio, the whole nine. And now we're video casting this. I don't know why. My mom said I had the face for radio, and she was right. Uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, we go live. So if you're watching the live feed, feel free to drop uh, questions. We can get to those or comments. Let us know where you're watching or listening from. We like to know that. Just secretly, I just, I'm always confused how podcasts get places. Great show for you tonight. We've never done anything like this. It doesn't make any sense, which is why it makes perfect sense. I love when you get stuff like this. Um, we've got Mike and Chase Morrison. They're brothers. We've had Mike on the show multiple times. Mike was like, you know, he's pretty internet YouTube famous because he's got like a, a gajillion views on one of his YouTube videos about why your scientific poster sucks. I mean, he doesn't say that. I say that. Why your poster like sucks, but then how to fix it. Like he doesn't just trash you, right? So he walks you through it. He kind of became famous that way. He's a PhD student doing uh, organizational psychology in Michigan. So we'll bring Mike on the show. Let's bring him back in there. Get some. Ah, oh, there's Mike. Jimmy! How's it going, man? And then last time we had Mike on the show, he was like, well, my brother does some cool stuff too. He's totally like, I usually trash my brother. My brother, my brother, yeah. he's not that cool. He was like, my yeah. brother does really cool stuff. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> he works from, he did some stuff from Marvel. And I was like, let's get him on the show. So bring Chase into the studio. Chase. Oh. All right. Chase, you were, you did like, Mike was giving you some pretty solid pump up. So welcome to the show. First question, always the hardest. Okay. What are we drinking? Oh, um, so I'm in New York, I'm in Brooklyn. So Five Boroughs Brewery, Summer Ale. Nice. It's got like a nice nice design on the can, which is like 90% of how I choose beer. I'll be honest. <laughs> they say don't judge a book by its cover, but it's so hard when, like these days when there's a million types of beers and like the cans are getting really like pretty cool. Yeah. And they're also just doing crazy stuff with like, it's a this infused beer and it's a peanut butter beer. It's like, I don't know. Maybe some yeah. of them are too far, but I think it's very like equal opportunity with alcohol. Yeah. Like I don't walk, know. Yeah. Yeah. At worst, it's 12 ounces of something. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Mike, what do we got going on tonight, man? I've got a dirty glass bottle of water filled with tap water. All right. But well, the bottle is actually a, a designer bottle Chase recommended. B so it's a very BKR. Clear, it's a BKR like bottle. It. Yeah. I'm doing shock top. So it's yeah. got the, the, the orange thing. It's it's just whatever was in the fridge. All right. So last time, uh, Mike, we had you on the show. You had, I mentioned in your intro, you had that really, really famous, I'm going to call it famous because I mean, had, I mean, how many views does that, that video have on YouTube? It's over half a million, but that's in science. So like, uh, like it's, it's big for science, you know, where like the average article gets like seven or like yeah. zero. But that's um, like the point, right? Which is like scientists or someone, you know, in this audience, mainly physical therapists will spend weeks, months, years working on something and then they'll get asked, they'll, they'll submit and say, come present at your research and you'll put it on a poster and they'll put it on this poster. And a lot of times myself included, when I was in PT school, they were just like, here's the template, fill in the blanks and then put it on the wall, stand awkwardly next to your poster and just reference. And can I ask you to answer any questions? And no one's going to talk to you. Cause that's just, we no one does that. That's weird. Could you imagine if you did that at bars or like to meet people like yeah. here, everything that I've been doing <laughs> yeah, my entire knowledge, <laughs> but you walk through and I want to make sure the audience will know this. We'll put the link in the comments as well. Sure. You walk through cause your background web design, but also organizational psychology. It's a weird experience. mix experience. It's a yeah. cool mix though. It's like radio DJ. I think they go together. Yeah. Radio DJ. Physical it does. Doesn't make sense. And you walk through a new design of posters and why this new design has some science behind it. There's evidence behind it. And you set it up a different way. And you're like, if the goal is to get the information from poster to people walking to by brain. Brain, yeah. this is how you do it. And it got half, it's half a million views. It's a big deal, man. We'll put the link in the comments, but that's a big deal. Yeah. So I saw your thing and I rarely watch a YouTube video for more than maybe a movie trailer, two, three minutes. And your thing was, I don't know, nine, 10. I don't know. 20. How 
20? I got you through 20. You didn't even notice. You said nine. I, like, yeah. I watched the whole damn thing and then like wrote a long post like, you yeah. guys need to watch this and then do what he says. And then we had you on the show for that. We brought you back for uh, some other stuff that you're working on. And that's when you brought up Chase. You're like, so Chase, he kind of, Mike kind of gave us like a little bit of the background of what you do. But what is it? Yeah. <laughs> good question. Yeah, good question. So, uh, so uh, I'm a trained inter in interaction design. So uh, the kind of analogy I like for interaction design is actually from the chair of my program. And she would always tell people like, uh, you know, the Wii, right? The Wii system where you like right. bowl with like the things, right? So somebody has to figure out like, oh, what gesture uh, does, does, is the best or most appropriate for bowling, right? Um, and so uh, so after school, I, I and also Mike, we kind of grew up uh, I would say in the kind of the church of film, uh, and I would say that quite literally. My our parents taught a film class at our local church, uh, so yeah, yeah. So um, uh, and the cool thing about it is that it was really just it, they just would use that as a kind of a way to prompt a lesson in theology. So um, and they would they did they do themes. So you'd have like a um, there'd be a, a science fiction theme, so there'd be like a contact and men in black, uh, and then they would edit it. And as we would be editing it uh, together, kind of sometimes as a family, uh, we'd be talking about it, like what these scenes meant to us, or like uh, what challenges are they talking about. Um, and so I think w we both kind of grew up with this really strong appreciation for storytelling and uh, kind of the language that is this film. So. Um, so currently, and I'll kind of, I guess, go into back, some backstory later, but currently I'm uh, working at a studio called uh, Perception, which is in uh, New York, uh, and they specialize in kind of uh, translating the tech of science fiction. So they do a lot of work in science fiction. So, for example, um, Iron Man, uh, they did, uh, if you remember, Black Panther, all like the holograms, like the Kamoyo beads that like come up and communicate to each other. Yeah. Um, all the thinking behind that uh, is, is perception. Um, and uh, and then the great thing is that they have all these clients come to them and they say like, oh, we just like love this type of thinking. How would you translate uh, into this into like a real product or into the real world? Uh, and that's kind of where my specific role uh, is. It's like we're so, Toyota. We want Iron Man's helmet, but in the next Corolla or whatever. Right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, literally. I mean, that's like a, <laughs> literally, yeah, uh, yeah, and then and then you know the challenge there is that you know uh, science fiction speaks to this like visceral thing, right? When you, I mean, like any special effect is usually um, uh, is usually something that's really that you feel, right? Like that is cool, or uh, or you know, a lot of times science fiction interfaces are really just meant to show complication. So it's like, wow, I can't use that, but Tony Stark can. Uh, so. <laughs> Um, he's, so he's you really, look at that complicated yeah, interface. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't read that Wikipedia article while he's flying over the Santa Monica Pier, but but he can. Uh, <laughs> Jarvis can tell it to him right in the end. Yeah, uh, and uh, I say that because if you look at that scene, there's actually a little Wikipedia article that pops up in in Is like Iron Man's head. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so it can be hard because you have to kind of figure out, you know, okay, well, what what is it that's valuable here, and what kind of thinking is valuable here? Um, but I think that was, that's kind of perception's mission is how do you uh, really think through the science fiction and, and get the practical uh, application. So so many things, so many things from yeah. both of your backgrounds. This this interview doesn't make any sense as a physical therapist. <laughs> it, it does because. A lot of what we do as, as physical therapists, yes, there's the physical part, but then there's the therapist, right? There's a lot of patient education and we call it, uh, you know, a, a, a therapeutic alliance. I need to build a rapport with you so that you trust yeah. me enough to not do what I say. I don't want, I never like to say do what I say, but like, listen to what I'm saying and then hopefully incorporate it in your life. And there's a difference mm -hmm. there, right? I want to inception you. I don't want to just be like, <laughs> I don't want to be a drill sergeant. I want to be like, hey, listen, like, here's the, here's the path. I want to show you how you can walk it right and that's what great storytellers do is they say um and there's a great uh great book called building the story brand which shows how products when they try to show you i'm the hero as the product you lose but if i can be as the product or the service the yoda 
then the audience can go, oh, I can see how I can insert myself. I can be the Luke in this story. And I think a lot of things fail like I've, in, in physical therapy. We got a lot of research on why like being stronger and moving is better. I don't think anybody out there would be like, no, I don't think moving's good. <laughs> yeah. like, why don't people move more? And I think it's because what two things that you guys bring to the table, which is narration, like, you know, narrative and how to frame things really well and tell a story. Because if I can hear that in a story, I'm going to remember that, right? When I say three little pigs, you know, remember like, you know, you know, huff and puff. When I say, like, you know, Goldilocks, don't touch other people's crap. Like there's yeah. a reason those stories were, you know, created. It's to teach a lesson. So, the you know, for the audience right now, the reason I wanted these guys on here is because I think you can always learn something from other people who are really good at their craft. And that's why these guys are here. Uh, Chase, I went to your website the, for perception. Yeah. It was really cool. I thought it was a little bit of an explainer video. It was really in the the movies are kind of the thing that moved the goalpost in you know consumer tech right first Tony you know Stark does a thing where he's like he's looking at a 3D thing and goes like this and it blows up and his, like even this motion that I'm doing you know what that is if you've watched any of those movies as a consumer yeah. you know this yeah. and that's so cool and it sets Tony Park of of being this like super duper you know engineer and everything but that's going to start to lead to real products eventually, right? Because, I mean, even the iPhone, I'm sure, I mean, yeah. when there, there was movies, there was a sure, there, there are iPhones in yeah. science fiction books yeah. in the 60s. You know, I, I mean, like Arthur C. Clarke, the, a lot of that stuff is really predicted by it. I think it's... Well, if, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Sorry. Go. No, I think that's something that, uh, yeah, no, I think you know a lot about this, designing the stuff. But, yeah, I mean, like Chase always tells me that, like, I think part of his contribution to... Usually, I just think sci-fi movie graphics are very just sort of like he said, it's like oh, glowy, cool, right? But I think I think one of the things they wanted Chase to do was make them actually useful. And Chase, you know, uh, bitches to me a lot about how you know a lot of interfaces don't make sense. They're not actually useful interfaces; they're just showy. But if you can focus on making making them useful, that's what leads to the real products. Um, I just said your own words, so maybe you should tell. <laughs> yeah. No, no, this is, okay. this is great. So wa let's walk through either let's wa walk through either a real or a hypothetical case study, like a so, PT clinic, as well, an example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's go through like a movie or someone that comes to you, yeah. Chase, and they say, "Hey, we need to add some some cool elements of tech to this." Yeah. Where do you guys go? Where do, where's the first? You know, where's the idea start? This is really interesting. I don't know his answer. I know he's going to say, go "Yeah." Ahead. Uh, you, yeah. The process is so fascinating behind when you see something in a movie, yeah. when you see Black Panther use something or Robert Downey Jr. use something, it's instant to you. But the thought that goes into it, I had no idea until I won't you explained it. Go ahead. Um, there's so much build up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mike, no, Mike, is, isn't Mike a great brother? It's just like it's really cool. Yeah. yeah. want to say no that. Right. Um, right. Like, uh, um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's really interesting. And it's been, it's, um, I would say, uh, what, so when I moved to so I moved to New York, I right after school, and Perception reached out, and I just had this like feeling like oh I you know I don't know anything about this industry. I just know that I love sci-fi movies, um, and I to me I, I kind of felt like oh you know I think they do a lot of more motion work or or those kinds of things. But what really drew to me Perception specifically is that there was all this thinking behind a lot of their work, and um, and so I think that like when when clients come to us a lot of times there's the typical kind of agency role, right? A lot of times when a company is bringing in an agency, it's for just some, either some fresh perspective, um, you're, kind of, you're kind of there to show different angles, um, and you're also kind of like a neutral party. So if you have something that's been internal in this company that's been really contentious for a long time, you can come in and you can just say like, oh, here's how it could be, or here's how it could be. Um, and so, so a lot of times they, they will use a lot of perception work to talk about, oh, here's how it could be, or here's an aesthetic that, that we could, we could. Oh, so they'll come in and just be like, design us an impossible like car tachometer or, you know, something for. So um, yeah. yeah, I don't want to skip ahead. Right. So yeah. from the layman who has only just gone to movies and just loves them, but yeah. there's not one company making a movie, right? This is what I'm getting. No. Like, you're brought yeah. in this and then the you know the stunt people are for this and the car chase so you're brought in this perception really works on technology or inner yeah. like, like well, how would you encapsulate it yeah so um and uh i can kind of zoom back and i kind of go into some more process but but I'll, to answer that question i would say that there's a couple cases right so uh one somewhat common case that i think is kind of shifting now is that 
they uh, they do this kind of more onset uh, improvisational kind of work with the actor, right? So, uh, for example, Iron Man Two, there's uh, a scene where Tony Stark has like his mobile phone. It's like, of course, transparent because why wouldn't it be a science fiction movie? Uh, and, <laughs> Those little comments, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and you know, I I was really down on transparent displays, but you know, I really do see. You know, you have to you have to really add a new level when you're when you're evaluating a science fiction interface. You can't just say like, oh, is that completely usable? Because there's some other quality there's there, right? There's some kind of disbelief yeah, too. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And you're going to have a takeaway that might be bigger. And so one thing I usually say is that um, that science fiction at best will get the big the, the big picture right. Uh, so an example of this would be. Uh, minority report, right? So minority report, uh, we use gestures all day long. Uh, but do we, do we send emails with an eight, you know, 12 foot display that we're like typing on? <laughs> no, right? That would be, that would be awful. Um, so, and you'd be exhausted, right? I mean, sure, if you're solving murders, uh, it's probably really fun. But like, if you're, uh, just you're responding to your hundredth email of the day, it'd be really exhausting. So, uh, another example of this, I think with movies, um, so regarding Henry, I'm sorry if, if this one is like a... Wait, a there's a special effect in Henry. Henry. This is that Harrison there's Ford movie in the late 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so it's about Harrison Ford, right? So this is not a science fiction movie. But uh, so Harrison Ford, uh, you know, really terrible guy. He's an attorney, uh, really cutthroat, right? Um, and then gets shot in the head uh, and is in recovery for the range of the remainder of the rest of the movie. He has to like relearn to walk and, and he has uh, a physical therapist do the whole thing. Right. And I can tell you that uh, I don't know if any of those stretches were correct or any of the things, those procedures that they did were correct. Uh, I'm pretty sure that when he like adds hot sauce to his food, that's probably pretty illegal. Um, <laughs> how, however, what I got from that was that for physical therapy, uh, relationships are the most important thing and that you have to approach it from a team. Right. I mean, is that you can correct me? Correct. That's what I get. Right, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so that takeaway is is what's valuable. So for Minority Report, for example, uh, gestures like so forward thinking, right? Super cool. I'm, however, maybe maybe the 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 fact that it's a large display versus a small display is the incorrect detail. So um, at, at at work, a lot of times, what we try to do is is kind of figure out like what is that thing. What is that detail uh, that that we can kind of relate to, and and how do we kind of use a pretty kind of methodological process of solving design problems, uh, kind of based around design thinking, to kind of get to those real life responses? Um, so you're and, saying, yeah. so you're saying it's really it's 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 in movies. The, the example regarding Henry and Minority Report is yeah. Bit, we'll get the big details right. And we're going to have yeah. some fun. Or we might miss with the small stuff. But yeah. if we paid too much attention to the small stuff, the story just meanders and never gets anywhere. If yeah. you know, we paid too much detail about which stretches the PT was doing, are they right? You're missing the fact that they're having dialogue while he's doing it. And that's the relationship with which the bigger detail we want right. to pay attention to. And people are yeah. looking at that PT character being like, oh, I could do that as a career. I like that guy or whatever. Right. Oh, that, yeah. that draws you into the story. Instead yeah. of right, instead of saying I'm the, you're right, this it's letting you into the to the to the hero role. Um, so so somebody comes in a movie or a pro, or, or or you know a, someone you guys do commercials and stuff like that. Um, they come in and they say we want it, we want this to feel futuristic or we want this to feel like it's a leap forward because that's the that's the emotion we want to project. And yeah. you guys get to come in as this third party and kind of have this fresh eyes, fresh ears. And they and and also when you're a consultant like that. People pay attention. I'm always mad yeah, because yeah. I put in roles where I've been the guy who's like in house, and then someone else will come in. And I'm like, yo, I said that. I <laughs> <laughs> but it's because the consultant said it. It's like, whoa, yeah. whoa you paid a lot of money yeah, for right. that. Yo, I was here. I'm in the yeah. room, guys. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so two things you brought up. So one thing that I really love. So uh, when um, I, so I interned at IDEO, which is like uh, this yeah. agency that does, um, uh, I've been around for a long time. They made the yeah, mouse. So they, literally the mouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, one thing that they kind of, they didn't invent, but they kind of implemented was this kind of thinking, of, uh, this process of design thinking, which is really kind of um, making the design process universal. I think w one thing that that I have always kind of hated about, about this kind of image of the designer is that they're always going to wear black, 
like me, right? Now. You, you, you oh, playing? you're kind of, yeah. <laughs> stereotype. Um, uh, yeah, but they're gonna, um, but they're gonna like walk into a room and be like, your typeface is terrible. Um, and, uh, and I think it's much better when it can be collaborative because, you know, if, if I was to come into an environment about physical therapy, I could not come into that room as an expert. You are the expert, right? So it's all about a sharing of knowledge. And I think what's valuable about those interactions is really that I am a new person, right? So you get to share something with me uh, as a third party blank slate and you get my honest like first reaction, right? Uh, or, you know, very curated and put through a like corporate speak filter, but like, um, uh, but yeah, you know, you get, you get that kind of uh, third party. I think that's really great. And there's a lot of processes you can use um, to really, I think, communicate better internally, but also in those, in those areas where you have maybe a team that is like, we don't need you here. Uh, and, uh, and you're trying to kind of come into alignment. Um, and one of those, uh, and this came kind of from, from my time at IDEO, um, is, is really to give everybody a moment to, to think and process about their idea and then everybody a moment to share their idea. Um, and uh, so in, in this case, so there's, it usually needs some sort of prompt. Um, and, and one of the ways that you can, you can kind of unpack a problem and start to analyze kind of the future of whatever company you're in uh, is um, one of the methods is called like a future pyramid, right? So you analyze three different uh, states. Um, I can actually pull this graphic up. Do you guys, is it okay? Hit share screen. Yeah, on the bottom. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Cool. We can describe it since it's radio. Like it's a pyramid. It's a triangle. A pyramid, like triangle. Levels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we could also make a big game show out of it. Be like, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can, <laughs> I'll describe it. Um, that's one element of of even this. You want to talk about like user design and what technology has been able to do. I mean, my podcast for the first 600 episodes looked like this. I mean, it was just what I used to do on the radio, which is a telephone interview or if the person was in the room. So whenever we were at conferences, I would do this. But um, most of the time and then COVID hit and it was like, wow, everybody's doing, you know, Jimmy Fallon's doing a show from home. How do we do that? And then I literally had to start thinking differently and even adding this extra element of, well, I mean, it's a pretty big element, right? Is video but what i got out of it wasn't just the ability to share a screen it was hey i can see when mike is really excited and can't wait to jump in so i know to like all the time smile or i could see a nod of agreement or confusion when i knew i needed to explain more so that that helped a lot so, all right so what are we looking yeah. at uh chase uh kind of so gonna, process here chase uh, makes so this is animations and stuff make mine look like finger paintings <laughs> Good. We got the link in the uh, the, the comments yeah. below. If we want to take a look at better poster, one too. hold our level. Yeah. This is very this is very stripped down, so you're not going to see a lot of a lot of jazziness. Um, so one of the things uh, we talk a lot about uh, is kind of this idea of the used future, right? And the idea is that you don't want to create a used future. And that text, by the way, is just for me to know the slide, but I'll, I'll get into kind of the content. Um, uh, so if I were just to ask you, like, what do you think used future means? Used future, you know, tired yeah. or you know, been there before, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the way you can think about it, and we didn't come up with these concepts, uh, but uh, is a, a kind of a future without transformation. So, for example, if you have like, a, let's say you're back uh, in the 30s and you have a rotary dial, and then all of a sudden uh, a multi touch comes out, right, on, and you can go straight to the iPhone. Uh, but you use that uh, to just make a better rotary dial, right? This is considered a, a used future, right? You're you're not transforming anything. You're not innovating anything. Uh, you're just kind of, you can't see past uh, your current state. Yeah, you didn't um, jump the paradigm there. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so uh, so an you see this all over uh, science fiction uh, because they are often products of the culture that they exist in, right? So. For example, Star Trek, the original series released in 1966, uh, it's set uh, in 2265, um, and they still use essentially floppy disks, right? Um, so, in, uh, so in the scene, you see like Spock, and he has this kind of like tape looking device. Yeah. And as cool um, as you can make that floppy disk, it still doesn't have any floppy. concept of like the internet or the cloud or like nothing, you know. Yeah. Right. yeah, right, exactly. It's not like the data would just already be there. Like, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of episodes deal around with like, oh, no, I don't know where that microtape is. Or do you have the microtape? So it's like yeah. the same type of language, right? Uh, and it's funny because when you consider uh, where microtape 
kind of uh, fits in as a fictional device around the time period. So you have uh, deck tape in 1963, which is kind of the first, I think we're one of the first like really cheap uh, magnetic uh, storage devices, 8-track 1964, microtape 1966, and then floppy disk in 1971. So really not, right, not a lot of new thinking around there. Um, but that could have been a story thing, right? Because it makes us it makes us relate more to the content that we're looking at. And I think they got uh, they got it right that it comes in uh, colors. Uh, yeah. And that you and that you just throw them everywhere. Um, That's cool. yeah they like I think I think Jimmy and I are getting like a free like ten thousand dollar <laughs> design thinking consultation here. People pay big money for, for, for IDEO grads teaching design thinking. I don't want to right. I yeah. use eight tracks in radio. We still use those. Those were really? like, played like the original commercials on. They were called yeah. tracks, but it was pretty much an eight track. So I was wondering that because so I, when I was watching Frasier, I noticed he had like this wall of like is Cart. that eight track? Yeah. Those were they're called carts. Like are they exactly yeah. like eight track? I don't know. I'm pretty sure they are, but they essentially like let you put a chunk of audio, right? So essentially like an MP3, like just a section. And then yeah. you could have a bunch of them and it, and it knew when, okay, I'm going to play this one. And when it's done playing, it'll stop. And I've got to hit it again to play the next one. Or if there was only one thing on there, it would just rewind to the beginning. So it was essentially a track. You used it for like promos or like sound effects. Like you'd have like a toilet sound effect or something. And that, that's all would be on that cart. Or oh. not. So that's how commercials were shifted in and out. Um, now everything's just a you know a big old playlist and whatnot. Wow. Huh. So when, so cool. when someone comes yeah. in, when someone mm -hmm. comes in and, and 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 asks for an interface, you guys yeah. get to bring this fresh perspective because this is what you do. They tell you yeah. know if it's a movie or, or a commercial company, they are narrative and you you figure out how you're going to jump into this narrative let's go towards where i'm interested in this where's your head go when we start talking about you know integrative technology with physical therapy uh, we just had an episode a couple of weeks ago where they literally sent out either an apparatus where you put your hand in and, and it'll either yeah. assist you or resist you from doing a wrist motion or a foot motion and since cool. this is video, you can do plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. Jimmy's doing a foot motion for those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like the color man. Um, <laughs> and what it does is it brings a game up on the screen and you can, you know, you can fly a plane up and down and things like that. But where does your head go with, hey, because the goal is to make the ankle go up and down. But really the goal for the user is like, I need this to be fun or I'm not going to do it. Like, I know it's good, but we know things that are good for us and we, you know, still do the bad things for us um, anyway. So where do you go? Do you go towards emotion? Do you go towards things that drive people? Or like, I'm interested in like, yeah, where do you go first to make sure that user experience yeah. um, is is driven, is pat? Like, I want to play this game more. Yeah, that, I really yeah. interested to hear your take on this too, because all I know is to make it very easy. But making it in, like, you know, if you make it easy, people will not not use it. They'll use it, but you have to make it really enjoyable to make it memorable and to have, oh, make it addicting. Right? Like the yeah, no it, the it, noise it, when I have a notification on Facebook, like it's yep, like everything, man, or like that little red. You have one notification. I have to see what it is, even though as I that advanced design tech that only how yeah. do you do it, Chase? Teach us both. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you, you have to start with the user, right? You, um, I think uh, one thing I, you know, you have to remind yourself of as a designer, I think, is that you're not the user. All, you know, very rarely are you, and uh, and you can't uh, you can't presume that you will even know uh, that you are the user. So, for example, one thing that was very common, uh, I think, fortunately, it's kind of like going away right now. But uh, there was this whole thing uh, in UX, which was like empathy experiences. Um, and, and so this would be like, um, you wear a blindfold to understand how, what it's like as a blind person, right? Okay. Um, and, uh, and Mike and I's grandfather uh, was blind. And so we kind of know what it's like to be around that. And I can tell you for sure that all wearing a blindfold is going to tell you is what it's like for a sighted person not to be able to see for 10 minutes, right. not what it's like as a blind person. Right. So, um, or someone with limited vision. So, uh, and, and I think what happens there that's, that's a bad part of the design process, which is that you're confusing uh, empathy with sympathy, right? So you might come out being like, oh, wow, that's gotta be so hard. But you really don't come out with this, with a partnership in the design process. And so I think that that is square one for any design project, especially one that's forward thinking or something that doesn't have a lot of frameworks around it. So by framework, I mean, 
Apple doesn't have to, you know, reinvent the home screen every time. They have an idea of how that's going to work, right? They have an idea of how their apps are organized. They're not reinventing these big, big pieces. But if you have a new technology, like for physical therapy, that really could enable a lot of people to, to get like a lot of health benefits from it, but you really don't know how they're going to adapt to it. You, you have to start with them. And, and so I think that would be the first step of the process is, is to get as many opinions as possible. And um, that was a big part of uh, my time at IDEO, which was uh, we would spend, um, I think we spent like uh, three to three weeks in Canada, just in every day, uh, six hours, like just interviewing people for the project we were working on to really learn about kind of. So what you're saying is like, you know, 10 minutes with a blindfold won't do it. You have to immerse. Like, yeah. I think three yeah. weeks in, in Canada is, it's not 10 minutes with a blindfold. It's immersing. Yeah. You right. Yeah. It's immersing you into it. But also it's like, it gives you, you know, you're not there to fix it. You're there to, to kind of work with them. So it's like finding that, that partnership in a way. Yeah. Um, and, um, because if you go into it to presume that you can fix it, you, can, you, you just can't. You don't know. Um, and saying like, I got this. Don't worry about it. I know yeah. I have, <laughs> your experience might be really more than me, but I got this. Uh, stand behind yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like I read a, a New York Times article on physical therapy. I got this. I yeah. know it. I want to brag, but I read three blog posts this yeah. morning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah. You guys obviously understand this. And I'm talking about you guys in terms of user experience and design. I feel like physical therapists, I don't know why, and I'm not throwing a profession under the bus or anything, but we like we can't wait to tell you how much we know. I can't wait to tell you why you're doing it wrong and you should be doing it my way. And and everything that I'm this is why what happens when there are two of them? What if you have like two physical therapists and one they are both, go, to, <laughs> go to Twitter and you would just watch and just berate each other in public on Twitter. Um but this is why I think that user experience or, you know, the, 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 the interactive design that the process that goes in the interactive design. Yeah. The gesturing on the screen is really cool. Mm -hmm. How you got there is the valuable thing, which is I'm going to immerse myself in Canada for three weeks or yeah. you know, everybody in PT school pretty much sits in a wheelchair for like an hour or two and goes around their community and goes, oh, man, that sucks. Mm -hmm. But that means I'm I, that doesn't mean I know what it's like to not be able to move around my community except in a wheelchair, does it? Yeah. I had a friend who was yeah. a, a patient advocate who was doing basically UX from a patient advocacy side. And she said like that, she actually called, she said the IDEO process. So throw a little shade here, but like the idea of like, they would lay down on a stretcher and get an IV to know how a cancer patient felt. Right. And she was an ex-cancer patient. And she was like, you don't know how two weeks or months of IVs feel like when it's the 50th yeah. IV. Right. And I'm sick of them. And like, that's, that's harder. That's something you can't ever get unless you really, you really talk to people. You can tell someone, but doesn't, it's like, it's like talking to someone who's gone skydiving before in front of someone who hasn't. It's like, oh man, it's crazy. And you're like, I know. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so big that it seems fake. And they're like, what? And it's yeah. like, so high. It doesn't seem real. And they're like, no, it's super high. And you're like, it is, but, and they're like, oh, man. So, yeah, you've got to really live it. You do. How does that, I mean, go ahead. No, what are you going to say? I was like, how do therapists do that better? Is it literally just saying, how do I, I mean, there's a guy in, in PT named Jerry Durham and he talks about the, 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 the user experience. I mean, he mm -hmm. calls it the user experience. He's like, and he's talked about before he's run clinics in San Francisco and he's like, I used to, this guy owned a clinic, was a physical mm -hmm. therapist, would grab a magazine and sit in his lobby all day for days. And it would just watch how people would be like, hey, do you take my insurance? And they're like, nope. And like, all right, see ya. And he's like, hold on a second. Why didn't you ask them why they were here? How they got here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they asked the question that they were accustomed to asking, which is, do you take my insurance? And you answered no. Yeah. At the end of the interaction, like, hold on, wait. Because how many dollars were spent or how much effort was just to get mm -hmm. that person to walk in your door and you let them yeah. ask the question and leave? There's two, a couple of things there that, that, that resonate so much. Like one is that like, I think a hallmark of somebody who's really into UX is they just watch users. Like, like I mean, like when I go to a poster session, that's what I, I just sit there and just, I just watch people like stare at posters and just not like, creepy, just not creepy at all, but like I'm for research, you know, and now I do it actually officially as part of study. So I have to, but like, uh, it's really fascinating because you really pick up on those small things. And the other side is like, 
how much money is being lost by not paying attention to them. I mean, like you just said, like people think, I mean, Chase, you probably relate to this, but people, there's this thing called the design maturity scale. And like at the bottom is you think design just makes things look pretty. You think it makes your fonts nice and things aligned, right? And then you start realizing it can make you money. It can really dramatically improve, improve your productivity and your profits and everything and make you more efficient. And when you realize that you get hooked on it, you start hiring UX designers and eventually it becomes so important that like, UX is baked into the leadership of your organization. And it's just in everything you do, right? Um, and it's like it's one of the most powerful things nobody knows. But I think Jerry sounds like a cool guy. I'm looking forward to meeting him. Yeah, he, oh, you're, he's yeah. outspoken. I, I, he like screams this from the roof. What's that like? I'm scared. <laughs> I know. One example that a boss taught me was um, running a radio station. You know, medium sized radio yeah. market where like, hey, if we wanted to spend nine hundred dollars, we did not need permission. But if we wanted to spend a thousand dollars, we needed like three people to sign off. And my boss at the time was literally like, hey, look at, we were in a meeting with like 30 people. He goes, no one needed permission to call this meeting. Although how many dollars, how many, you know, how much is everybody making per hour? And all these people are just are in this room. We don't even know why we're just, it's somebody called a meeting. I had to come. How much more than a thousand dollars was wasted calling this meeting? Nobody signed off on it. But if I want to spend money on something that I can show you, or at least convince you will bring us something, awareness, money, whatever. I needed like three people's permission. And a lot of times it's like, nah, that's not going to work. So it's like a lot of times people will say, well, you're just watching posters. How do do something? You're like, I am. Yeah, I am. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like the fact that he's looking at it from two feet, he has not moved closer. He leaned in yep. for two seconds to be like, maybe this will, no, bye. You know, like, it's like, yeah. it's like, uh, like you pick up on so many subtle things. Um, yeah. Can you, Chase, can you watch movie? You can't watch movies the same way. I've always oh, asked yeah. him that. Wanna, yeah. Because yeah. like, we I, always I, say, like, we go to the movie theater and watch the Marvel movies and cheer when the interfaces come on because those are what Chase did or whatever. You know, not when, like, the hero ends or whatever. Like, oh, man, look at Black Panther's dashboard. Beautiful. Or whatever. You know, like, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Like, uh, one's the perception did, not the one that's the, that I did. Well, and so, the yeah. Nothing, you did are out yet, right? You're doing the, yeah. next, the next round of Marvel movies. Well, yeah. And nothing like I don't usually so uh, yeah perception has like just the world's best like uh, 3D artists and everything like that um, and so they will they usually work on that side I think where where I work in is more the conceptual the conceptual part of it um, uh, and unless it's a uh, for usually if it's like more of like the um, tech clients or the clients that want more of the functioning side of uh, mm -hmm. the approach. That because be that's gotta work, it. work hand in hand, right? Like I'm imagining yeah. you do a lot of this you know immersion where you're trying to figure out like. What does this mean to me? I mean, because I work in communications in physical therapy. So people are like, hey, make a really cool thing. And I'm like, okay, what does cool mean to you? Because I don't want to go away right. from yeah. mm -hmm. it. Like, Yo, this is sweet. And like, mm -hmm. oh, that's not cool to me. Yeah. So I'm imagining you just said that you guys have the best designers, right? And they could design the coolest thing. They could do exactly what Chase told them to. But if Chase didn't take the time to listen to what cool or innovative or conceptual meant, the designers can't succeed. So I imagine there's a lot of like, a lot of, you live in a world of questions, I'm guessing. Well, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Tell me more about yeah. that. That was Absolutely. deep, Jimmy G. Yeah, that's great. No, I mean, this is, is perfect. I mean, and, and there's a lot of approaches to, to how you answer that question, right? Of what does cool mean to you? I would say that um, the, the typical design thinking approach would be, you know, a, a month of research and then here's, your, here's what we found, right? Here is the one thing you should do. Um, what I think is really interesting about perception is that they will, we will, it's like you just do, you just visualize, you produce so much uh, and, and, it, and it really allows people to, I think, evaluate uh, kind of, oh, that's where it should be, or, oh, it's actually over here. Um, and, uh, and it's, I mean, it really is, uh, it's such a fun, uh, our brainstorms, I think, are very, very fun because it's, you're talking about sometimes like uh, otherworldly technologies or uh, in the case of Black Panther, uh, it revolved around how do you make um, uh, how do you make technology feel different than Tony Stark since this was kind of an isolated place, um, and so it has to feel really advanced, but it can't feel like it's oh, it hasn't had any cultural pollution well, at all. Talk about that yeah, for that for that movie for Black Panther, so you have the Tony Stark technology, which I'm I'm guessing was like let's just make it the most cutting edge, but when you brought Black Panther in, Wakanda was more technologically advanced but it had to look earthy it had to look like it had the elements involved because that was their that was their thing right everything was earth and trees and sand so yeah. it almost had to have that that difference in it. it had to look more advanced yeah but but more 
I don't know. Earth, Earth yeah. Water. Or it had to have its own identity. Yeah. Yeah. In a way. yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. It couldn't be as glowy and slick. It had to have some element of the people that were using it and created it, or it wouldn't seem like they created it. Yeah. And I, I would say that, uh, uh the, my creative director, uh, is, is really versed in both languages uh, as far as like in special effects and visual effects, but also in user experience and the customer. And I think it's, it's super rare. Like, uh, and so he has this really wonderful ability to really kind of weave those paths a lot of the time. Um, and I think he's he's also this kind of, uh, he really wants to empower kind of the films that we see to to really care about, you know, how, how are people interacting uh, with technology? What can we do? Because a lot of times there's kind of the loop. Um, and where it's far as like, uh, you know, you, you produce science fiction that influences today and then that produces, that influences more science fiction. So you, uh, you can really, you kind of can, in, in a way, paint the, the future you want. And one great thing, and as far as describing where Mike and I sit on the, the kind of the career timeline, or I guess uh, the, the polarity of where we sit in the industry is we're kind of on far ends of the part. So Mike's an academic, right? Trying to get to move towards, be, appreciate the more visceral qualities of uh, things like hierarchy, um, readability, right? And then Perception sits in an area where it's in the super open-ended space, trying to pull it back towards uh, with more academic kind of mindsets around uh, interaction. So, um, so it's really it's really great, and I, I think that there's um, uh, I would say that so much of our process when it's more for film starts with looking at science and what what's happening in science. And I will say that that process is very difficult, Mike. Uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, this is a whole other rant, but like Chase, you know, he'll contact me like, hey, I'm looking for scientific articles on on uh, you know material science to design a new special effect. And how do I get them? And I'm like, well, first the lecture, like you can't, right? And like you know, I did, I definitely didn't share my academic login. That's not what I um and, and tell him exactly where to go. I did not do that. I did not show him SciHub. That would be terrible. But I mean, and like it is, I mean, like he can't find it, right? Like it's like, well, you would normally, you'd think you just Google it and click links, but you can't do that because academic articles are so horribly published. But like, um, yeah, I think he he'll go in like Chase. You're like you'll read articles on like on prototype materials and things like that to develop yeah. these things for movies so that the science will inform the special effects. And then a lot of times, like you said, it'll go the other way. Um, so you're talking about this spectrum where you have Mike who's over here, academics trying to get acad academicians to be more narrative and storytelling. And you're yeah. at the storytelling end saying, okay, it, it can't just be all flash and yeah. cool. it's you have to have like, some logic and it, yeah. rooted in it or yeah. Yeah. a little bit of suspended disbelief, but you can't just do sure. stuff where people are just like, I, that is, that's not rooted in anything. That's I, there. I don't feel like this is real. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not going to believe it. So it's that, that that's why you guys are on the show today, which is we need to make it interesting enough to pay attention. <laughs> and I didn't know where I fit in the story and it's gotta be, but it's gotta also be legit. It's gotta be useful. Yeah. yeah. yeah every world collide. Yeah. It is. And yeah. I, I think like uh, even the stuff Chase is saying about design thinking usually has academic roots, you know, I mean, like interviewing people, right? There's something in psychology called the hidden profile task. And it's a simple experiment. Basically, you give everybody a unique piece of information. They have a valuable piece of the puzzle. They can help solve the problem. And the game is get everybody to share it, right? And it's really hard to do that. Like if you think of being in a meeting, right? Um, there's always like the one dominant figure and things like that. And the other people who have this valuable information, a lot of times you won't get it out. It'll just, they'll leave, you know? Um, and so if you really are so thorough about your interviewing, you'll get out all of that hidden profile information, all of those like secret competencies, you know, like you didn't know like your intern in like this other department was obsessed with like your, this something related to your problem for a summer, you know, because it was it related to a video game you played. You know, you have no way of knowing that based on his job position or, you know, her job position. But by just really deeply interviewing, you'll find that. So that's that's rooted in psychology too. And so is the what is that um, called? Hidden what? It's called the hidden profile task. The game is you give everybody a valuable piece of information, and the game is to try to get everybody to share it so you can solve the solve the problem. You need everybody's piece of information to solve the problem, and you need all of that to come out. If that I mean the therapists right now are listening and saying, Wow, if that isn't therapeutic alliance and making sure that the patient feels comfortable enough. Number one, comfortable enough to tell you things that maybe they wouldn't think are your purview. Because like, people are like, physical right. therapy, why are you asking me about this, this, this? It's like, well, that is in your body. So we have, it might, it might be important, but we don't know. 
And then right. uh, how do I get everybody involved to know that they are actually an important part of this puzzle? Everybody I is. Can't, it, I can't do a push up for you. I can't do a squat for you. So I need to make sure I put you in the narrative where I'm like, hey, I know enough to know what you need to do. And I also want you to come along with me on this journey where you're the hero so you can do it. Because if you don't, we both lose. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that buy in is and that interpersonal bonding, too. There's so many outcomes psychologically of, of any kind of interpersonal bonding you do like you'll even like your emotions will be more contagious with each other if you're more interpersonally bonded you'll respond to each other faster um you'll see each other's different you, day-to-day differences if you get to know a client you'll probably notice changes in him faster or her you know um where because you're seeing it at a lower level um whereas if they're just a stranger to you they're kind of distant right. um things like that um when, uh, so before before I got in, uh, or I went back to corporate design, I, uh, I worked uh, for Apple Retail. Um, and we I both started, paid our dues. We did, <laughs> yeah. Thousands of trainings, right? Yeah, so uh, so there was, I don't think it's around anymore, but um, uh, so there was, I worked from 2007 to 2014. Uh, so it was something like, uh, and so there was a membership you could get called One to One where you come in for training. Um, and uh, you could come in kind of like as much as you wanted, really for workshops, for personal training sessions. I taught everything from like, you know, how, com- how a computer works to uh, Final Cut. Uh, so I taught all of the pro apps. Um, and I did that for, yeah, so like, I think, like rough estimate is like 11,000 individual training this sessions. This is why he speaks really. Similar <laughs> people. Um, sometimes, sometimes, yeah, not all the time. Uh, but, you know, I will say that, you know, a big part of what you'll, what you're just talking about with relationships, um, I saw a lot about kind of what keep first off like fear that people have with technology, what keeps people from from adapting to certain technologies, um, uh, and um, a lot of it has to do with the trust of the person. Um, as far as you know, do do you have a rapport with them? Do like are I had so many people come in and like they felt like I was going to scold them like their family member for getting it wrong, you know? Like, um, and and I will say a big part of what we're we're success. Uh, was found, I think, was when people had a goal or something that they wanted to do with technology. Um, you actually had someone on the podcast, uh, Leslie. Walking. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So she was talking about videos. I think she even mentioned going to the Apple store uh, for help. And that would like that would have been like my favorite type of, uh, of training. Equipment. She had a goal. Someone. She had a goal. Yeah. Well, at, least close, at least close. Like she, she could probably tell you about it, but maybe not where it exactly is. And you were like, great. I know how to, I know how to go from there to here. Exactly right. Yeah, because I think what, what, what you can see a lot of is like, oh, my, my uh, son got me this computer and they say I should know it, right? And uh, <laughs> I just, uh, and you're just like, well, what do you want to do with it? Uh, and then they're like, oh, I don't know. I guess I just need to know it. Uh, and um, all so, of it? Jeez. Yeah, all of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, it's, uh, so it was really hard. And, uh, and I think that, uh, in, and honestly, it was, if you had a, uh, if you were object oriented, um, there was nothing that stood in your way, right? So age wasn't a factor. Um, and, and actually Leslie said that she said that she's more literate, like technology literate than a lot of 20 year olds. And it's so true. I saw it all the time. There's this kind of, uh, notion that, uh, that if you are young, that you are automatically instilled with the gift of technology. Right. Um, but, but that, that, that is earned just like everybody else. I think we're just, uh, if, if you grow up in it, you're just a more accustomed to it. Yeah. Um, and, in my and world, mental models. With my, yeah, with my world is the smart thing, right? So like in, in academia, you work with, I mean, some of the smartest people in the world who like have no idea when it comes to technology, right? They're, oh. they're, they, they, they can, they can cure cancer, but when you've got to, they've got to like send an email, it's a horrible example, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like that where these are people with just stratospheric intelligences, but they don't necessarily, that doesn't translate to skills and, and intelligence research shows that there's something called positive manifold where like generally, you know, the smarter you are, the better you are at things. Right. But that doesn't make you good at things. Like it doesn't translate to skills. You can right. probably pick them up a little faster, but like, if you have no, like you have no schema for how it works, you have to develop a schema like everybody else, even if you develop it faster. I got money off my tuition in, in graduate school because I was a graduate assistant and you know universities will spend exorbitant amount, amounts of money on software because you got to buy licenses for the whole faculty, right? And then mm-hmm. no none of the faculty would use it. They'd track it and be like, hey, you guys say you want advanced technology. We bought it for you, but nobody used it. And the reason yeah. was like, I, I couldn't figure it out. So my job yeah. was to really make videos like yours, Mike, like explainer videos. Yeah. Like, okay, so here's this thing. And like, I'm going to show you how to do like 10 things. And That's I would do 
I would use Powtoons. It was like an app, like a plug yeah. Powtoons. And I would do vo funny voiceovers. Like, we're going to do this. And my job was to explain it because so many of the faculty who were super smart, like way smarter yeah. than me in all their different areas, right? Phys yeah. you know, physics professors. And there mm -hmm. I am showing them how to use the new version of whatever, just because that like some of them wouldn't dip their toe because they're like, I don't have time. I'm not even going to But there's that insecurity too, right? It's like, you don't right. want to, like, you Which can't admit what, that you're yeah. not smart at this or whatever, even because you're yeah. so smart in every other area. It's like twice as hard, right? And the people who are like, no, I'm an idiot. Go ahead and teach me. Or like, they do much, much, right. much better. Yeah. <laughs> Leslie was just like, I had a goal. So I wrote three words down from what Chase had just said there, which was trust, goals, and fear. Right. And those are like, it's yeah. like trust is on the, is like, okay, I've got it. And then fears over here, but the goal's in the middle. And if you can get yeah. back, use one to get past the other, you can get that goal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's where I feel like every time Chase said the word technology, we could literally just dub out therapeutic alliance. Like it was like, it's like th technology therapy. Like it, it, does it matter? Like this is, and I've, I've said this before again, which is, uh, a former guest had said, you can't solve a human problem with a technology solution. It ha you, yeah. The technology solution can assist, but it's got to be a human solution to a human problem. You can solve a technology problem yeah. with a technology solution. But storytelling and therapy are, are narratives, right? And so yeah. that people problem, you need a people solution to it. I'm not saying you can't have technology that assists you in your daily life. You can have screens the size of, uh, of a wall and you can send giant emails with your arms or whatever you want to do. Um, but ultimately it needs to be a people problem, so, yeah. uh, people solution to solve a people problem. One thing uh, we had at Apple a lot was uh, there's a big difference between like a feature and a benefit. So like a Ooh, yeah. feature, feature is like, oh, 500 gig hard drive, 2.6 gigahertz Intel Core i7, red. right? Yeah, red, yeah. Uh, red. Uh, yeah, red, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, and, uh, and then a benefit would be like, um, First off, to know the benefit, you have to know the person, right? Like, so you, you have to know, like, what uh, what is the benefit to them? Um, and then, uh, and once you know that, then you can connect it to what, you know, what what technology solution. Uh, but yeah, you can't work backwards from the technology. You have to work backwards from the person. Yeah, and I think that have you got have you you looked into the benefit pyramid? Have you heard of this before? No. Oh man, can we get this on screen? Let's do it. I'll see if I can do it. Um, and it's, it's in this book, um, Building the Story Brand. And the guy didn't even um, invent it. And I think I got it on my own. I think I got it somewhere. Bridget, can you find that benefit pyramid? Yeah, she's going to look for it. But essentially, it's it's this pyramid, right? I mean, we all love pyramids because like Maslow's yeah. High Evenings is like the only pyramid I knew. And it yeah. starts at the bottom. And we look at this with this podcast. We look at this with other products. And it, it, he, they kind of teach you like the bottom is the kind of lower hanging fruit. But you need that base, right? And that's like shelter, food, water, you know, heat, whatever. And then as you get towards the top, it's like self-actualization or self-transcendence. Oh, you got the sixth level. I was waiting for oh. it. Was, yeah, there's six. The, the right. self-transcendence came in later. Sorry, I was happy. Right. The psychology student in me was super happy about that. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. But the idea is Apple wound up being, this is like a business model on how, how, what makes it valuable. There it is. See if we can cool. make it bigger. Can you just like zoom in on that or bring it up? I'll, I'll narrate it. All right, back up. All right. So on the bottom, it's functional, right? Everything in the bottom of that pyramid reduces effort, avoids hassles, right? Quality, variety, sensory appeal. Like all these things are checking the boxes with like an iPhone, right? It's like, oh yeah. Ooh cool it connects save time simplifies as you go up you go from functional to now emotional and this is like probably a lot with movies and films which is like i want to connect to this character if i don't care about tony stark if tony stark is just a dick i don't care about him I, he's just a villain and i hate him but like you kind of like tony stark you can see how he's kind of like you know torn or whatever so like it goes to emotional like therapeutic value uh badge value which is like hey me having the newest iphone is actually cooler than you because you have the oldest iPhone. And that's, mm -hmm. that's why I want to have the newest one. Uh, nostalgia. Sure. Then as you move up, after emotional goes to life changing. Like, does it actually motivate you? Like a Peloton bike. Like it's in my basement right now and I got it. And it actually like gives me like a badge every time I like, you know, work out like three days in a row. I want to have that. Um, affiliation and belonging. Like, ooh, I can now talk about, you know, so-and-so instructor on the uh, Peloton bike because I have it and you don't. And then it talks about like heirloom, like things that you can pass down. like And, and so uh, ultimately it leads up to self-actualization, life-changing, but then s uh, social impact, self-transcendence. Like if you can achieve self-transcendence and just for the audience, I have never achieved self-transcendence. I'm still working on my way there. Um, I bet you, I wrote a, I wrote a paper on just self-transcendence. I bet you've had it. 
Yeah, I really, it was my first paper in graduate school. Right, They're like, me, what does that wow. mean then? Like, give me the deep. It was on the definitions of saying, like, <laughs> I think uh, it's, there's a for this moment then. Yeah. Yeah. Lay it out for me. So, like, there's a couple, but I think um, Maslow's definition was that um, you are standing in line. You, you picture yourself as connected to a broader like a broader context. So like you're standing in line at your high school graduation or something and you picture all the people who graduated there before you, little things like that, right? Where you're sort of detached from place and time a little bit all the way up to what he called like a self-transcendent peak experience. And what those are like, or Jimmy, you probably had this. If somebody, those that first time someone was like, dude, I heard your podcast. It was awesome. Uh, when you'd never heard that before. And you're like, holy yeah. shit, someone listened to it, right? Like, and you're like, I'm, yeah. And like, and when you get that, and you feel that really overwhelming sense of like, I'm actually doing something that's making an impact out there. That's a self-transcendent peak experience. And the way self-transcendence is supposed to work is it's basically a feedback loop with self-actualization. So there isn't, they didn't really specify how to get to self-actualization. And usually the, the way I think you said to get to it later was you go through self-transcendence. If you find a way to get those peak experiences where you feel yourself connected to this like positive, broader impact, it helps you sort of actualize and want to pursue that feeling more. It's it's really like an addiction kind of thing. And it, it hooked me, you know, in my, like, I think I, I started, you know, a website that got very popular and um, I would get those emails, you know, those thank you emails. It started with those, which I'm sure you've gotten. And you know how good that feels, right? That it's better than a like on Facebook to actually yeah, make a difference in someone's life, right? And like, once you get hooked on that, nothing matters anymore. Like, like nothing, like no amount of money, like money's great and all, but like, I, you just want more of that feeling. And I've talked to people all the way up. I've talked to people who've like worked at the UN and like redesigned governments and things. Right. And I'll ask them about that feeling. You know, like, what does it feel like to reshape a country and, and give more job opportunities to people or things like that? And they'll just shake their head and say, I hope my kids get to feel it. And like, wow. that's, um, that's what that self-transcendence is. It's really knowing that you could die in a car wreck tomorrow and you made a difference. And like, I think we all get those feelings in little ways but I will give you that few people chase it. And when you do chase it, you get more of it and all you want is more. Yeah. Um, and that's why a lot of people, I mean, for me, it's a stupid thing, but like the poster stuff, people, you know, like there's a reason I put it in the public domain. There's a reason I, you can use it freely and steal it crazy. It's because like, I don't care about the citations. I care yeah. about seeing the change, you know? And like, cause that's what gives me the high, you know, it's like, it's like, a, I made a difference. People like this. It's helping people. Holy shit. Um, and like, that's, that's really that. Or like, if you can give yourself a broader purpose. So, you know, the other, uh, one more example is the Victor Frankl example when he's standing, when he's at a concentration camp and pictures himself teaching other people about what being in concentration camp was like, it got him through the concentration camp, but, wow. you know, having, identifying as being the person who's going to tell this story, um, gave him a broader meaning. So those are a couple of the definitions. Yeah. I mean, if we're getting deep, oh, we're making this a therapy session. Like, Sorry, man. Well, no, I mean, yeah. I, I tell people all the time, you know, I, my goal is to have fun and learn something with every episode. Yeah. And that's why like, you're bringing on somebody from Marvel and then the, like, it's like, well, yeah. I'll have fun. I'll yeah. learn something. And along the way, if I, if some with one other person, there's three people watching this live right now, yeah. usually we put on an episode, we get three, 4,000 downloads within a, a week. If one other person learns something like, I will have felt that feeling that you just described. That, you that Someone learned yeah. something. And here's why for me, people ask me all the time, like, are you a real PT? I'm like, because I don't treat patients currently. And people are like, I don't understand how you went to PT school for three years. You spent all that money. And now you just do like podcasts and videos. I'm like, well, here's the thing. We get 100,000 downloads a month. If one of those people goes and takes a thing that I, Mike and Chase taught me and us and takes it and does something with it, they might go change the world. And I yep. wouldn't have been able to do that unless we did it this way. Because this is the only way I know. Or was yeah. one of the I know. This is that's like that, that is so you have experienced self transcendence. Wow, I that means you're more actualized than you might have been otherwise if you had if not done this podcast. <laughs> With a funny, I had actual attention going on. Um, I love too deep, stuff too like deep. this. Uh, I love when you find think but just people who do cool stuff. Like you know, I've I've been around my friends who were like we've been to parties and they're like someone like Chase will walk by and like you'll tell me what you do and I'll just be like, oh man, and then my friends literally just know they walk away and they're like he. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> an hour he's going in circles and a bunch of different tangents and like if you have anything to do chase you might want to walk away now because jimmy's going to grab your ear <laughs> like this conversation i just I, I think that the really tapped in pts will be like what or would would understand why we had you you guys on here because their their wheels are probably already turning like how do i change my clinic how do i change my approach to patients 
how do I change my approach to life or, or, or to other things that I interact or even just knowing the why behind the things that happen in movies. Like now you get to appreciate it more, which is kind of how we started with growing up in that church of, of cinema, which is like, why'd you cut up movies? Well, movies are there to teach lessons. And hey, did you maybe you missed it, but we're going to rewind it. And we're going to show you this clip. Like, what is this actually trying to teach us? And I think that. I mean, that's why we, you know, it's why we read books and watch movies and reread or tell stories and is to make sure that other people don't miss those moments. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. Um, let's yeah. do, uh, we're going to do three questions. You guys good for three questions? We do this with every, yeah. every guest. So sure no, should go first. I think we do three questions. Three questions brought to you by our friends at Arias Medical Staffing, leaders in uh, travel PT. Love those guys. Uh, having therapists uh, find great jobs where they want to do it in the country. So where do you want to go? That's the question. Open-ended. Where's your narrative take you? It's all different for everyone. So is it a lake? Is it an ocean? Now, some people are like, I don't want to go to the beach. And some people are like, I want to go to the beach. Uh, so find out what works for you and do that. A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. That is A-U-R-E-U-S medical.com. Uh, first question is a where question, obviously, since Ari is all about travel PT. Where, uh, Chase, you're in Brooklyn. Uh, Mike, you're in Michigan still? Or you're in Florida? Florida right now. Yeah. Right, professor at USM uh, now. Where, where, would, uh, where would you want to go, Chase? Anywhere in the 50 U.S. states if you're going to leave Brooklyn? Oregon, Portland, Oregon. A lot of friends there. I've never been. That's so cliche, oh, nice. hipster. Uh, <laughs> hey, you're a hipster, you're a hipster, man. Yeah. yeah, I know. Everyone that mushroom coffee. There you I go. But, Mike, Michigan to Florida, but where else? Anywhere else you'd like to explore? I mean, in, in yeah, in the 50 states, I still vote for Montana so I can drive real fast. Where do you guys drive? Uh, Atlanta. Atlanta. Oh. Yeah. All right. Second yeah. question is a what question. What have you watched, read, or listened to that you think the audience could get value from? Movie, book, podcast, anything? Going Good. You are. Okay. Uh, so um, I would say a, a kind of a... Um, a fun book on interaction design failures is uh, Set Phaser to Stun. Ooh. Um, so it's all about kind of, I mean, it's really, some are really horrific, but they're all these kinds of uh, design failures that led to kind of horrific consequences. I like it. Set Phaser to Stun. The Trekkies out there yeah. understanding that. For sure. Yeah. I like it. Uh, Mike, what do you got? Yeah, I think. Um... I go off of like uh, Dan Norman's book, I guess I'm reading now, The Emotional Design. I think that's the next level. If you can make design emotional, like you've won. If it's easy and emotional, it's so much harder. But if you can make those, you know, your clinic, not just like you they can find the right tools and the right weights, but like it's fun to find the weights. I think you've really succeeded at something. And how have you painted the walls and what does it sound like? Exactly. You know, impression. Like why not you, just the first time, but the fifth time. And why, why do you care about that? Mm -hmm. the user cares about that. Even if they don't yeah. know, it. Uh, I'll throw one in, which kind of ties in both of the things you just mentioned, which is kind of storytelling um, and bringing into a narrative and also actualization, which is a movie I've only watched twice because it's a, it's, it's one of those heavy movies where, it's one of my favorite movies. I've only watched it twice. It's Gleason. It's a documentary of Steve Gleason, who was a prof uh, NFL football player who, after retired, was diagnosed with ALS and then just began kind of camcordering because it was, you know, back in the camcorder days, um, lessons for his unborn child. It was, it was just found out his wife was pregnant, started kind of giving his son lessons in life, and it wound up teaching him a documentary. He went forth. We've had some people on from his his uh, foundation and Team Gleason, his, his charity on the show. Cool. And if you want to talk about hitting all the a lot of things on that pyramid, why do people donate and want to be associated with that particular ALS organization? It's because they told a great story and they drew you in. Yeah. I mean, it's it really is. That's a good one. It's, uh, free on Amazon yeah. Prime. So if you got Amazon Prime, oh, perfect. When you need a good story, he sounds uh, like he was like a true believer too. Like he was doing it for the mission, and like that's that's so if, powerful. If you watch one of his little, you know, kind of camcorder things, you will not have to even doubt exactly what you just said. Yes, that's cool. When you look in Steve's eyes, he believes it. He's just those people are so scared. powerful. Yeah, and I'm, I look at those people. I'm like, damn, how'd you get there? Because I'm curious. Suffering yeah. horrific amounts of suffering. Yeah, like, yeah, like, oh, oh. right. Yeah. Um, last question on three questions is a who question. Who's someone the audience should know more about? So I'm going to say uh, Chris Nossel. He uh, so he wrote uh, or was one of the co-authors of Cooper about face, which is kind of a uh, interaction and UX design kind of bible. Uh, and uh, but he also wrote um, Make It So: Interaction Design Lessons from Science Fiction. So he is the first person I met that I was like, we are like the we are like I aspire to be 
as like the level of dork of you, right? Like, does that make sense? Of, like the nicest way I mean it, right? Like, yeah. uh, cause I, I like, I loved, I loved movies and, uh, and he was the first person that I realized like I had this kind of academic connection to science fiction and movies. And I yeah. think that was. Well, you look at Star Trek and like how many of those things came true. Yeah, like totally. Yeah. You know, like when, when, um, what was it? The, what was the walkie talkie phone? Nokia? Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek. The Star Trek. Yeah. Or the, oh, uh, oh no, you're right. The um, uh, Nokia. What was the walkie-talkie? This, I, what was it called? Nextel. Was it Nextel? The, like, and I was yeah, like, and, the first time I saw that. I was like, we have comm devices now, <laughs> and like, people can never talk to them normally. They had to yell at them. Because, they also had to, like, <laughs> Why are you always holding it like this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I just yeah. want to point out that you, the the two things that you answered on uh, so far three questions were make it so and set phasers to stun. So we already know which yeah. where your allegiance lies in terms of Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so who who's the who mike dan Ariely has a ted talk on meaningful work and motivation that is my favorite i'm, I'm a meaningful work researcher i was for my master's it's my favorite experiment on making work meaningless and the punchline is it's something called the sisyphus experience which is probably really relevant to pd clinics if you feel like you're putting in a ton of work for no return or negative return for worse, just rolling that boulder up for no purpose. It's the like most researched back way to strip meaning from a task. And he has a really ingenious way that he tested that in the lab that was really sadistic, but memorable. I mean, the, the, the big buzz phrase in PT right now, and I think for the last couple of years, burnout. You want to talk about a reason for burnout? If there's no- Oh, it's instant. Yeah, doing, exactly. That's, that's the, the Sisyphus experience has got to be huge, I would think, in PT. Um, and that he, but what he did was he basically had people build Legos, and in one condition he disassembled the Legos in front of them and handed them the bricks back and see if they wanted to build more. <laughs> and like, like people just stopped the task. And, like, you know, and in one condition, I think he put them on a shelf or like right, like look what you've built, and people would just keep right. building them for less and less money. But when he just like hey, tore them apart and handed them back to them, they would just like they'd stop the task much earlier. What's so, the point? If there's no point, yeah, I'm not gonna. Yeah, continue. exactly. Last thing we do is uh, is called the parting shot. Let's do the parting shot with these guys. Cool. Morrison Brothers. Parting shot brought to you by our friends from the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. If you're looking to level up your game, they've got the courses for you. Current concepts of orthopedic PT if you're looking to get your OCS. Uh, tissue tolerance, brand new. The running athlete. I feel like if you haven't just bought a bike in the last few months during COVID, you've you've bought running shoes and you've taken that up. So you might want to bone up on uh, the running athlete. You might see some injuries in your clinic. Parting shot, Mike, Chase. Chase, last, go first. Yeah, go last ahead. chance. Okay. For, like, just dueling shots. Moment, right? So just wow. what you want the audience to be thinking about. What do you got for me? Rather competition. Uh, so uh, there's this quote that I've always caught resonated when, when it comes to like technology and fear. And it's a Stephen King quote. And it says, uh, all you have to do is make a suggestion of something unknown and your audience's imagination will fill the blanks with truly terrifying details. Um, and so my uh, solution to that is to, if you're ever scared of technology or feel like it will take over, is to just open the closet door and learn as much as you can about it. Don't read about it, actually do it. So whatever you're scared about, figure out your way of actually participating uh, in the technology. And if you are designing robots, don't give them machine gun hands and red eyes. No, don't do it. Yeah. It's not going to turn out well. Yeah. I feel like, again, you could take technology out of that if you're if you're concerned about a diagnosis or something that's wrong with yeah. you. Keeping it in the closet, keeping yeah. it on the bed or you know in the yeah. sewer, right? With it, that's the easiest way to make it scary because you're going to fill it with all the scariest possibilities. So yeah. go embrace that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. No pressure, Mike. Oh Jesus! I guess I think. Um, a lot of things in life give you the illusion of change. Like they fluctuate, but really they're fluctuating around a baseline or a set point that doesn't really change. Um, and if you really want to achieve change, you have to move the baseline. So if you think of like punching a Bobo doll, you can't just like hit the Bobo doll harder because it's just going to come back to that same point in time, right? You have to like add weight to the Bobo doll or pop the Bobo doll. That's the only way to really start changing what it fluctuates around. So you gotta change it. I like that's it. just dynamics in psychology 101 is people usually have set points. The lottery studies, right? Like yeah, I mean the thing that when you started talking about that and kind of you know putting that picture of the Bobo doll in there, which was um, do you want to raise the ceiling or raise the floor? I mean, we want to do both, but people exactly the thing is to raise the ceiling. It's like, well, how about we raise the floor? Like, what if we got yeah. you know, you know, universal health care or something? Like, wouldn't that right. be 
you or we could have lasers or you know robots doing surgery it's like that's that is cool but let's let's feed the homeless and you know clothe clothe that is a that is a underlying situation change right like that's yeah, yeah. All right, gentlemen. I appreciate this. I was very excited for this uh, for this talk, even if it's just selfishly just me. I don't care. I learned some stuff, so uh, I appreciate your time and your expertise. Keep doing what you're doing. I love it, and uh, thank you guys. Cool. Thank, thank you, you, Jimmy. Good to see you again. Bye.